Rajesh, uh, I would be talking to, I would be talk, giving a talk on Desmet's membrane detachment, which is again a common uh, problem that we may encounter after cataract surgery. And although it can occur after several surgeries, I will be basically covering the DMD following phacoemulsification surgery. So uh, uh, the etiopathogenesis of uh, DMD, if you see, it occurs following intraocular surgery, but it may also occur spontaneously. And this is important because in some cases, even if there has been no major insult, it can occur. And this is mainly because of the abnormality in the Desmet's stromal interactions. And there is a mutation of TGF beta induced gene dysfunction of keratoepithelin protein, which causes weak adhesion of Desmet's membrane to posterior stroma. So if you do see loose Desmet's membrane preoperatively, one should always counsel the patient about the same. Uh, it can also occur in Fuchs dystrophy. It can occur in mature cataracts. Uh, then if you see the intraoperative factors, it can be because of surgical or pharmacological trauma and postoperatively, it can be because of uh, uh, topical drugs at, as well. If you look at the intraoperative factors closely, it occurs more with the clear corneal insertion, shallow anterior chamber, uh, more with the conventional insertions as compared to femto insertions, use of blunt keratomes, shelved or anteriorly placed in insertions. And if there is an inadvertent injection of saline, viscoelastic, antibiotics, during irrigation, aspiration, and stromal hydration, or during IOL placement. And when the ultrasound has been more than 60 seconds, then this is believed to increase the chances of DMD. Now, like I said before, it is important that preoperative counseling and careful surgical planning should be done, especially in those cases which have loose DMDs, because there you would like to go for scleral tunnel or superior corneal tunnels to avoid inferior DMDs with temporal insertions which will uh, then uh, need a SF6 or C3 affect gas as opposed to the air. So the aqueous enters the pre-desmetic space and uh, along the tear in the desmet's membrane, the incidence following ECC is 0 0.5 to 2.5%. The incidence following FACO is lower, 0 0.04 to 0.5%. And if you see gonoscopically, you can pick up a lot more DMDs, but of course, these are not clinically significant. Patient will complain of poor vision after surgery and slit lamp will show that there's a discernible translucent layer as, as can be seen here. You may have to put topical glycerin to dehydrate the cornea and there can be coronary edema and double anterior chamber and at times visualization may not be possible due to a very stormy post-operative course. So you may see nothing. And gonioscopically small peripheral detachments can be seen, but again, this may be difficult because of corneal edema. You can do uh, anterior segment OCT and UBM. What is the difference between the two? The difference between the two is that both have similar reproducibility, sensitivity, and specificity. But AS OCT is superior to UBM because of the fact that it provides higher resolution of the images and it can accommodate multiple angles of incidence to tissues, whereas UBM will only take the ones which are perpendicular to the sound energy. And more importantly, it is a non-contact procedure. So this is what you would see on ASOCT and this is what you would see on a UBM. If you classify the DMDs, it is of three types. Way back uh, when it was classified, it, it was classified as active, passive or detachments because of difference in the elasticity between parenchyma and glass membrane causing Desmet's membrane to roll on itself or to form folds. Then the McCool classification was given in 1977, which said that it could be planar, non-planar, it could be central, peripheral, or combined, superior or inferior, with or without scrolled edges. And generally, planar DMDs have better prognosis, and those without rolled edges may reattach subtly or even conservatively. Then you can also classify it as regmatogenous, tractional, or bullous complex given by Jacob. So this was a classification which was given by Dr. Devya Kumar, and um, this dependent, it was called as HELP algorithm. Uh, and divided into three zones, one, two, and three, depending on the height, length, extent uh, of the, uh, of the uh, DMD. <coughs> this is the classification that we've given based on the anterior segment OCT, because this is also helps you to, uh, also helps you to uh, arrive at an algorithm of management. So if it is there in the superior half and if it is planar, which means less than one millimeter, you would use intracameral air but if it is in the superior half with scrolled edges or it is in the inferior half planar or scrolled edges, you would use intracameral SF6 or C3 F8 gas. Now, uh, this is an elegant paper uh, by Dr. Dua and Dr. Rajesh Sinha et al. in which they have classified uh, DMDs depending upon the pre uh, desmet Dua's layer where uh, type 1, the PDL and DM both are detached and type 2, only DM is 
detached. So here it tends to be taut, whereas here it tends to be curly. And then you can have a mixed type where you have both. It's a taut one and a curly one, which means the PDL and DM both have detached. And these have further been classified as rigmatogenous when there's a tear here, visible here, or non-rigmatogenous when there is no tear. Now, if it is a small peripheral planar DMD with non-scrolled edges, then spontaneous resolution can occur and it is wise to give medical management, which could be in the form of topical steroids, uh, because that will decrease inflammation, topical hyperosmotics, because that will pull the uh, water from the cornea or dehydrate the cornea. So sodium chloride, 5% drops four to six times a day or sodium chloride ointment at bedtime, along with cycloplegics and anti-glaucoma medications, if required, can be given. However, if it is a DMD, uh, which is there, uh, uh, which is uh, encroaching the visual axis like this, and uh, though in those cases, you will have to give uh, uh, air injection will have to be done, such as in this case, go from an area which is clear. This is a 30 gauge needle which is being used. Make a single bolus of air bubble as is shown here. Notice that this, this area is a little hazy right now. But we've known by our lamellar keratoplasties, which are endothelial, that if you uh, put that air pressure for some time, then it kind of clears up even on the table itself. And as the needle comes out, you put a little bit of pressure over there because you, you don't want the air bubble to come out with your needle. Alternatively, one can put a blob of viscoelastic also over there. Now, this is again to show you a curly kind of a dismatch membrane detachment, which is large from limbus to limbus. Again, when you put air bubble, uh, it looks although it is attached, but it is not attached as you, as you see in the intraop OCT microscope. And again, in this case, you give external massage. So on the table itself, it will become clear. And that is one indication that it has got uh, attached. And this pressure can be given for good seven to eight minutes, positive pressure. And then it causes the attachment of the Desmet's membrane. In this case, because it is a large one, so one can use a gas gas like SF6. In this case, C3F8 was being used. Now, it is important from where to put in your air or C3F8. So if you put it from the area of a scrolled edge like this, then you will increase the detachment. But if you put it from the green arrow here, then you will decrease the detachment. And this case was referred for endothelial keratoplasty. But when we gave C3F8, uh, there was uh, attachment and clear, clearing of the cornea. Now, this is an ASOCT guided management algorithm for DMD after intraocular surgery, which I uh, talked to you about, which is based on 37 cases who did not respond to 24 weeks of uh, cataract surgery. And uh, the, the DMDs therein were classified. And this is the algorithm that we uh, arrived at as to how AIR or SF6 or C3F8 has to be chosen. So these are some of the cases from that study only to show that how the dismiss membrane has got attached at various places and at various extents uh, post dismetopexy. Sometimes you don't even have to do their shallow, they will get attached, but a large one like this needs uh, attachment. And uh, these are again, a set of cases to show how if there is a dismiss membrane detachment, like for instance, you can see that it is here and here it is there on the ASOCT. So uh, all you need to do is put a bolus of air over there and it gets stuck. You can see that it got stuck to the back of the cornea. So important thing is that you diagnose it on the table itself. Then here again, there's a Desmet's membrane detachment, which is present at the incision site, which can also be seen here. And as you put the air bubble there after, it is important when you do you know, uh, diagnose that, first you hydrate the wound. So when you hydrate the wound, it, the, because of the hydration itself, it will come closer to the uh, detached DMD, the stromal uh, part. And then you put air bubble over there from the side port with a big bolus. And when you do that again, uh, notice that this Desmet's membrane will become attached. Now here again, there is a Desmet's membrane attachment, a small one, which you can see here. Even if you leave it, probably it will get attached uh, spontaneously or by itself. But once you've diagnosed it, it is always best to put air allow it to remain attached and then burp it. This is a case of ECC I will, uh, in this case, there's a curly Desmet's membrane detachment, which you can see here. And again, in this case, it is best to put gas like SF6 or C3F8. Again, in this case, C3F8 is being put because this was a torn Desmet's membrane. So you, you want it to be attached and you want the endothelial cell migration to occur over there so that it gets attached in the post-operative period. Now this again, 
is a desmet membrane detachment and which can be seen here and then subsequently uh, the uh, ga uh, gas is being injected here and external massage is given here so if you see that it is not getting attached then always substitute it with the external massage although this is looking a lot more clear but it's not got attached and this is post dalk when you can have the whole complex coming down and again you need to put positive pressure and uh, see that it is uh, attached so uh, uh, sometimes you have to suture it now this was a case which was a recurrent desmet membrane attachment so air bubble had to be put there you were there with the positive pressure for some time and then with the help of the suture tensor or monofilament nylon suture one had to suture it and then this bubble remained there for some time because one uh, bubbling one bubbles one time bubble did not cause its uh, attachment and again when you take out the needle be very careful when you take out the needle so that your uh, gas or air bubble uh, doesn't come out repeat desmetopexy can be done and it has been shown in various studies and again we did this study to see in incision side desmet membrane detachment what happens to it and we followed 100 plus cases where uh, incision site desmet membrane detachment was there on post op day 7 and post op day 1 and nearly almost all of them at day 7 get attached so uh, uh, whether on asoct or clinically the incision site wound do get attached but they are related they occur more with increasing age increasing rate of nuclear hardness and increasing uh, cde now this was a study uh, by in, from our center again which compared femtosecond wounds with the conventional wound and said that the incision site dmd was far less as compared to the uh, uh, as compared to the um, conventional wounds now this is again a case of dalk in which air bubble has been in where desmet membrane detachment has occurred air bubble is put but even after you put the air bubble the shallow detachment is there and so you do intrastromal drainage and when you do intrastromal drainage uh, from the top the uh, and give the air bubble uh, intracamerally then it has got pretty much attached so uh, sometimes you can have uh, persistent corneal edema and desmet membrane detachment and then you may have to do endothelial keratoplasty as is being shown here uh, where you are doing a desec surgery uh, and uh, that remains the option but in most cases we really don't have to do if you pick it up early and then there are cases where you may have to do a uh, uh, demec surgery where a healthy desmet membrane is taken uh, but again this would have to be done only when there are large dmds uh, which are present and not for small uh, peripheral or dmds which are planar so this is just to show that it does clear up pharmacologically ro kinase inhibitors can be given in these cases because uh, they will cause a decrease in the corneal edema and help in the pumping of the corneal corneal endothelial cells and this probably can be combined uh, as has also been shown by dr kinoshita where he injects these um, uh, endothelial cells uh, and then gives prone position uh, to the patient along with the ro inhibitors and this is a article on um, desmet membrane detachment which gives almost everything about what i have spoken just now so to conclude uh, it is important that you die, you first see it on the stet lab do asoct in all the cases uh, if you've picked it up intraoperatively how so ever small it is please address it at the same time and of course if nothing it doesn't respond then one has to uh, do endothelial keratoplasty pharmacological therapy is not may not be the uh, replacement for endothelial keratoplasty because dmd is something which is a mechanical separation and so it has to be dealt with a mechanical injection of air or c3 f8 or sf6 so thank you very much for your kind attention